we're in ancient times hundreds of years ago. We notice that uh, when we're walking with a beverage, it sloshes all over the place. And we see that the faster we walk, the more it sloshes. And if we're riding on a horse, then we notice that it's completely spilled all over the place. So we come up with some kind of a naive, naive conception that any kind of motion causes this kind of an effect. And you kind of intuitively see that the more the motion, the faster the motion, the greater the effect. Now this was what people pretty much assumed until around the time of Galileo. And he pointed out that if you try to modulate the uh, motion that's unnecessary, for example, if you're jumping up and down on a horse and so on, and it has nothing to do with the actual motion and straight along, and the smoother you go, the less the effect will be. And of course, today we have an intuition developed from being in cars and trains that move at 50 and 100 miles an hour, and in planes at 500 miles an hour. We can walk down the aisle with a, with a, a cup of liquid, sit down in our seat, and if we weren't looking outside, we wouldn't know that we were moving. We certainly wouldn't be able to tell the difference between moving at 50 miles an hour or 100 miles an hour. And so we developed the notion of an inertial, uh, uniformly moving frame, a uniformly moving state uh, system. And we know that they are indistinguishable from each other. We also know that, in fact, they're indistinguishable from a stationary frame. There's no difference between standing still and holding a cup or moving at 50 miles an hour or 10,000 miles an hour, if neglecting any kind of air resistance effect and so on. So this is our more modern day notion of inertia. And in order to conflate all the uh, examples that I gave, not only indistinguishability of uniform motion, but also uniform motion and stationary. So we don't want to talk about inertially moving frames because it's not necessarily moving. We'll just call it inertial frames or inertial states. And we talk about frames and we mean maybe there's a laboratory that's going to measure whether or not there's any kind of effects and you could have a particle moving, and then you'll have an inertial frame with a laboratory around it measuring that particle to try to see how it's moving. And if it's a system of particles, to see if there's any kind of inertial effects among them. So now I would pose the question, would it necessarily be the case that we would say with today's conception that one can always tell whether or not one is accelerated? Simply look to see if there are inertial effects like the sloshing of the water. So is that true? Do you think it's true? It certainly seems that's what we learned, isn't it? Yes, I suppose, yeah. Okay, can you think of any kind of counterexample? Like, could it possibly be? You're pretty sure, everybody's pretty sure that that's true, that if something is uniformly moving or stationary, which is the same thing, they're in an inertial state, that there won't be any kind of inertial effects. And contrary case, if it is accelerating, there will inevitably be inertial effects. However, there is a counterexample, and that was uh, pointed out actually by Newton and later by Maxwell. Equally accelerated forces, imagine we're in outer space, we're very far from any kind of conceivable physical effect. We can't even see any distant galaxies. And there's some kind of field nevertheless there, and it accelerates everything exactly the same way. Everything is accelerating. Now things could be moving within that system in different ways, they can have different velocities, but the acceleration that they acquire as a result of the field affects them all exactly the same. So if you think about it, if you're moving with a cup, right, you're accelerated by, you could be standing still and somebody next to you is moving with the same cup of beverage. Now, all of you and the cup and the fluid are all accelerated by this field. So, however you're moving or not moving, your acceleration is the same as the acceleration of the cup, is the same as the acceleration of the liquid in the cup. Your acceleration, let's say you're standing still in your frame, and this other person is moving uniformly next to you, and they expect to see no sloshing because they're moving uniformly, and you're standing still, and they're uniform to you. Is there any way that we could ever detect this kind of equally accelerated field? What do you think? I mean, that sounds like uh, um, gravity, effectively, right? Good. That sounds like gravity. That's where we're heading. But in other words, that's a counterexample to what we just said before, that all accelerated motion would lead inevitably to inertial effects. 
So in other words, we can see that this kind of field, which of course we have an example is gravity, right, does not produce any inertial effects, even though the motion is accelerated, which is kind of weird because we always used to think that it's not true, that any accelerated motion leads to inertial effects. Now, there is a principle in physics, which is kind of a heuristic principle, but if things are indistinguishable, they're identical. If you can't measure the distinction between two things, between two states, there is no physical meaning to saying that these two states are different. They just have the same values. If they're completely identical in measurement, then they're identical in nature. And so if you have two frames moving with a uniform motion relative one to the other, and you cannot distinguish between the two, then you identify those states. And the same thing with stationary. So you consider all inertial states to be fundamentally identical. There is certainly no difference between states moving at 50 or 100 miles an hour or 10,000 miles an hour, nor is there any reason to distinguish between them and a so-called stationary frame, because one person's stationary frame is another person's moving frame. So we say that they are all indistinguishable and therefore identical. Now we have a more sophisticated version of that, and we can see that even if you have accelerated objects, if they're all accelerated in exactly the same way in any given region, there's no way to distinguish between them, and therefore we'll consider their states to be inertial. If it seems exactly inertial according to every measurement we can make, then we identify it as in fact inertial. Now, of course, one can ask, even in uniformly moving frames, um, we could be in a plane and we're moving at 500 miles an hour, and it's true we don't notice any sloshing, but maybe if we turn on some kind of electric device, the electric device works differently because it's in motion at 500 miles an hour. So it's certainly conceivable that some physical effects will be different and motion dependent. So this is something, of course, that you have to test. Eventually people test it and come up with some kind of principle and say, no, there are no measurable effects to inertial motion. All inertial states are identical. And you cannot in any way consider one particular frame to be moving and the other one stationary. And now we can do the same thing for these equally accelerative states. We can try to do an experiment and say, OK, let's say we're convinced that mechanically there's no relative acceleration. And therefore, we should identify the state as inertial, even though it's supposedly accelerated. But maybe if we turn on some device, there would be a difference. So Einstein's principle, his principle of equivalence, or part of that one aspect of the principle of equivalence, was his blanket statement in saying there is no phenomena which would behave differently in such a frame. Now, I'm going to find, define the word free fall. What does that mean? Free fall doesn't mean only falling. It means that your acceleration is in the direction, let's say, of gravity. So if you throw something up and it curves down, right, all the while the acceleration is downward. Acceleration is always in the same direction, downward. So it's constantly be said to fall even though it's rising. So free fall simply means you're not resisting the gravitational pull on you. That's the free part of it. So this is, if it's shot out as a projectile at this angle, nothing is resisting it. It's not resisting the gravitational pull, and it's constantly being accelerated down. It's considered to be in free fall the whole time. An orbit is in free fall the whole time, even though it maintains, if let's say it's a circular orbit, it maintains exactly the same radial distance from the center of the Earth. It's considered to be in free fall the entire time. And of course, something that's dropped straight down, radial infall, uh, obviously is in free fall. But it's in free fall on the way up as well as down. Now, in the case of this equally accelerated force, if you don't resist the force and you're accelerated along with the field and everything is not resisting and so everything is accelerated in the same way, there's absolutely no way to determine that there's this field. And if something is resisting the field, well, you can point to them and say, well, you're resisting, you're doing something. It's you. It's you that's not inertial, not me. Okay, so now we have this strange example then. Let's say we're here in this building, and we always, certainly in high school, we assume that the gravitational field is the same everywhere, 9.8 meters per second square pointing down. I mean, why complicate matters, right? So somebody at the top 
floor and somebody at the back in the basement and somebody on that edge of the building and somebody at that edge of the building, they're all measuring the same acceleration. There is an equal accelerative force acting on all of us. Which means if we don't resist that force, if we allow ourselves to be in free fall, then effectively we are inertial. Now, Einstein says, if you can't distinguish any effect of this kind of motion, you claim that it's accelerated, you say that there's this force of gravity, and you can't measure any kind of acceleration, this is indistinguishable from an inertial state, and I claim that it is inertial. Now, of course, it sounds ridiculous, it's absurd, and one can easily make several objections. I can think of two objections to saying that these free-fall particles are inertial. For example, anybody want to suggest? We don't measure inertial forces, we know that. But what else, what other qualifications would be needed, maybe, for us to consider this to be inertial? Okay, well, one is the trajectory is certainly not a straight line, right? Inertial trajectories should be straight lines. Another one is that, I mean, here I am standing on the Earth. I'm stationary, right? I'm inertial, right? Right now, I'm not moving, I'm inertial, okay? I take something, I throw it up. I mean, I see it accelerating the whole time. This is accelerating. You can't tell me it's inertial. I, I am inertial. I'm not moving. And that was accelerating. So those are two simple disproofs. So should we reject this idea that gravitational free fall is basically inertial? Well, we think deeply into it. Einstein did. And he realized that one can easily overcome these two objections. If you imagine yourself in free fall and you're watching any free fall object, whatever the trajectory, I'll show you in a minute why, how you can see that all of those trajectories are actually straight lines. I think it looks absurd for us with straight lines. I mean, obviously it's curved. But think of it. If you're in free fall, right, just for a simple case, let's make it free fall, meaning radial infall, straight down. And you're seeing some other trajectory which is clearly curved, right? Now, what's happening, imagine you're right next to each other, just to simplify matters. We're keeping the essential ingredients there. You're near each other and you're falling. Both of you are experiencing exactly the same acceleration. So as this is moving past you, it's going up with its initial velocity. It's also being accelerated downwards due to gravity, right? And you are being accelerated downwards due to gravity. If your acceleration is exactly the same, as it indeed is, then there is no relative motion acceleration between you other than due to the initial velocity. But that's a uniform motion. You have an initial velocity, whatever it was, it was ejected out of a cannon at, you know, 1,000 miles an hour, whatever it is, in that direction, right, making a curved trajectory. But at any point along that curved trajectory, if you're in free fall alongside it, for that instant that you're alongside it, it's passing you, right? For that instant that you're alongside it, then this particle has exactly the same acceleration as you do, and so that's effectively canceled out. You have equally accelerated forces on you, the relative motion due to acceleration is gone. You've eliminated it by free fall alongside it. And that would be the same thing for, let's say, even an orbit. You have a circular orbit, and you're in free fall like this, and this thing is in an orbit around like that. You're both experiencing the same acceleration downwards. So you have no relative acceleration there. The only difference between you is this one has a velocity tangential, and you have a velocity down. But you're relatively inertial to it. You're both in inertial motion relative to each other, and therefore you will actually see the trajectories as straight lines. And that's pretty amazing. So we've knocked off one major objection. But the other objection seems even more serious. I mean, right now I am on the floor, and I am not accelerated, I am stationary. So, you know, it's very nice that you're telling me that in a free fall frame, this is a straight line locally as, as, it's, as they're passing each other. Right? But what am I going to do about the observer stationary who clearly sees them both as accelerated? So Einstein's answer is, well, we know that gravity affects all masses in the same way, 
right now I'm experiencing, you're experiencing weight. Your weight pulling down, but actually what you feel is not your weight. What do you feel now? Do you feel your weight on you? What actual force do you feel? Uh, the normal force. The normal force, resisting the weight. There are non-gravitational forces at work in the floor and the chair, and they're helping you resist. The gravitational force is pulling you down, and the non-gravitational forces are pushing back up, so the sum of the forces are zero. So what you're feeling actually is a force upwards. Now what's interesting, if we take everybody and every object here, we all have different masses. Maybe we have different densities. There's tables, there's chairs, people, and so on. But if you divide by each person's mass, so you take their weight divided by the mass, what remains? It's a quantity that we don't really have a name for usually, but what are the units? Okay, so you have, we all have weight. The weight is basically the gravitational force on us. Right? Obviously, the weight of everybody here and every object in the room is different. But partly because of size, partly because of density, and so on. So everybody has a different weight. But if you divide everybody's weight by their mass, what will remain? Uh, the acceleration or gravitational acceleration. Some, it's not exactly gravitational acceleration, because gravitational acceleration is something that actually moves down. But it's, what remains is basically exactly the same as the, as the gravitational acceleration, something with units of acceleration and the amount of the gravitational acceleration, but it's some kind of a push acceleration upwards. Okay? And it's identical. Everybody's push acceleration that they're experiencing is exactly identical because it's mass independent. The weight is the gravitational uh, g m over r square, m of the Earth, times your mass. Your acceleration is that divided by your mass. So it just leaves the gm over r squared. So everybody, although they have different masses and densities and different weights, has the same amount of gravitational push acceleration, which is, again, it's coming from the non-gravitational forces of the floor and the chair. They're pushing back up. But what you're experiencing is an acceleration upwards. Now that acceleration is indistinguishable from what? What other physical situation would give rise to exactly the same phenomenon? A whole bunch of people in one place, and they're all experiencing exactly what we're experiencing now, in in sense of the actual feel of it, and in the physical sense, the mathematical sense that we just described, that we all have acting on us a an upwards accelerative push, so to speak. Uh, the, you see, something, yes, something like that, but let's say what would give rise, you're, you're right, but what would give rise to exactly this? We're all sitting in a room and we feel a force upward, centrifugal force be pulling you to the side and so on. Just to give an exact example, what would be, what would produce exactly this? If you imagine this building, like it goes exactly, if this building was an empty, distant space, and there's no gravity around anywhere, but the building was accelerating in this direction, we would feel exactly the same thing. And we would measure exactly the same thing. So what does Einstein say? If you can, if you feel the same thing and you measure the same thing, these states are completely indistinguishable and therefore they are identical. In other words, there is no physical meaning to saying that we are not now accelerating. We are accelerating. We are accelerated because the system, in terms of what's measurable physically, is exactly that, accelerated. And that answers the second objection. So we had a free fall particle. In that free fall frame, there are equally accelerated forces, so no inertial forces are, no inertial effects can be measured. Everything is moving relative to each other with constant speed and so on. There's no inertial forces at all. The trajectories that each one will see, even if they're moving within that frame, will all be straight lines. And the frame which contradicts them and claims that they're not inertial experiences inertial effects, exactly identical to those of 
an accelerated frame. So it's, it's like if you were inertial in empty space, far away from anywhere, and you are inertial, you have no inertial effects, and some spaceship goes by, and the rockets are on, and it's accelerated, and they're pressed back against their seat to have accelerated forces, and they look out and say, you're accelerated. You look at them and say, I'm not accelerated. I don't measure any inertial forces on me. You say, well, I can see that you're accelerated. You look at them and you can see their chest is compressing. You say, you're undergoing acceleration. I see those accelerated effects. You're not in an inertial frame. You can't tell me that I am accelerated. I don't measure inertial effects. I, I see on you that you have inertial effects. And that's exactly the situation of gravity. Here we are, standing on the ground, feeling this push against us. And if we measure, we find out it's all the same accelerative push. And so we are accelerated. So we certainly cannot tell this free fall particle that it is accelerated. It's us. And so that's Einstein's model. He says, you take an inertial particle in free space. It's moving inertially. It enters into a region where there is matter. And it's affected by gravity. It's still inertial. It's still inertial. A gravitational field doesn't stop something from being inertial. It was inertial, it still is inertial. And that's pretty astonishing. However, again, we come up with an objection. Can you think of an objection? We have this model. It works astonishingly. It's consistent, right? Free fall is inertial. It's amazing. It seems to work. But maybe you can think of, it has something to do with something that I snuck in, kind of, and, and sometimes when you ignore something, uh, it turns out that that was the essence. So what we pretended here was that we have a uniform field, right? Top of the, floor, top of the building, bottom of the building. Zone. What really happens, of course, is if you take two particles and you let them go, then they all fall, they both fall straight down, but they're aiming towards the center of the Earth. So I'm going to exaggerate the difference, but one is kind of aimed like this, and the other one is aimed like that. Obviously, I'm exaggerating greatly the angle between them, but clearly they have a different direction of acceleration. Also, if I hold one above the other and I let them go, this one being closer to the Earth than this one will have a greater acceleration. So this one accelerates down more than this one does. So between the two, there will be a relative acceleration. This one is accelerating more than this one. Now, if you see particles accelerating relative to each other, I mean, it's clearly obvious that they are not inertial. Now, you can say one of them is inertial, the other one is accelerated, but they're two identical particles in the identical situation. There's no way to distinguish one from the other. And you can't say that one is accelerating the other. Obviously, if one is accelerated, it's because of gravity, and then so is the other. So this relative acceleration is a clear giveaway to the non-inertiality of these particles. So again, there we are. You know, finished model is over. Right? Can anybody suggest a way around that? Einstein didn't accept that. Einstein went ahead. He said, no, 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 no. This is true. I know a way around that. Okay, now the word for, for these accelerations, these are relative accelerations, we call them tidal accelerations. Okay, in gravity, you have this relative acceleration, it's called a tidal acceleration, and you can see that if you're fault now, so now the question is, we can maybe come up with a way around this and say that in the same way that gravitational accelerations disappeared in free fall, right, if you're free falling alongside something else that is in free fall, there's no gravitational acceleration, they move inertially, maybe this also disappears in free fall. Right? If this, this phenomenon disappears in free fall, then it's not a real phenomenon. It's just something you observe from a non-inertial frame, this accelerated frame, the Earth stationary frame. So what do you think? Does it disappear in free fall? So if you think about it, you'll see that because there are not equal accelerated frame, not equally accelerated uh, results on these things, we know that one is accelerated more than the other, so there is a relative acceleration between them. Everything that we spoke about before was when there were equal accelerated forces, right? Clearly, there are not equal accelerated forces. 
And if you're falling alongside them, then the average, so to speak, is wiped out. The average acceleration between the two, if you're in the middle, will, will be wiped out. What you will experience, you will see this one accelerating away from you with the difference and accelerating away from you in this direction with the difference. The, the amount that this is more than you, that's the amount that it will accelerate downwards. And the amount that this is less than you, lesser acceleration, you will see it accelerating upwards. Right? So you're accelerating with the same acceleration as their average. And therefore, all you notice is this one going up with a more and this one going down. I and mean, this one going up with, it with a less and this one going down with a more. So what you see is that. And what you see when these two particles are accelerating this way and you're going straight down, what you see is this one and this one, both of them accelerating towards you. Okay? Because they're accelerating like this, right? But the downwards acceleration is canceled out by your free falling alongside them. All you see is this component. Now the question is, is this component a relative speed or an acceleration? You can see and you can do the math that if you're accelerated along this direction, you're going to accelerate in this direction and that direction. So you can have a relative acceleration to you too. So what you notice is if you put a bunch of particles, these will, sorry, these will separate and these will converge. Right. Now, in Newtonian gravity, you can do the calculation that's all over the web. You can see that if you took a sphere, a sphere of particles, separate particles that are just put together in the shape of a sphere, they're not glued together. As it falls, it will turn into more like an oval, like a football, like an ellipsoid. And it turns out that the volume remains the same. That's a beautiful result. And it has to do with the fact that it's divergence div A is equal to relative. So. Okay, so, so now we try to get around this objection to the model by saying that maybe in free fall the phenomenon disappears and we can see no, the phenomenon does not disappear in free fall. There is incontrovertibly a relative acceleration between the particles this way and that way, even in free fall. So that would seem to make this model completely inconsistent. You can't, nobody is going to see something like that happening. And all these are identical systems and identical states and so on. There's not that one of them happens to be accelerating the other. There's a relative acceleration between them. So obviously they're all accelerated and they're not inertial. And so again, there goes the model. But of course Einstein said, no, I'm not giving up this model. Now, can you think of just some audacious way around it? Without I'm not going to refute any of the statements. I'm just going to blaze forward. Just say, well, it's very nice that there's a relative acceleration. So that is the phenomenon of gravity. Gravity is the relative acceleration of inertial particles. You have neighboring inertial particles. They are inertial. Each one is inertial. But there's a relative acceleration between them. Now, it sounds absurd. You say, well, that's impossible. So I say, says, no. That's the fact. You cannot distinguish any of the individual particle state from an inertial state. And therefore, both of these particles are indeed inertial. And yes, there is a relative acceleration between them. And so that, and not gravitational acceleration, is the phenomenon. What we thought was the phenomenon of gravitational acceleration, right, changing the trajectories, that is not real, because that disappears in a free fall frame. Those particles are inertial. What is the phenomenon of gravitation is the relative acceleration of inertial particles. And that's just a fact. That's a fact about nature. So now let's say we want to do, create some kind of uh, a field equation. So if we were doing gravity, so we have the gravitational force, and usually, at least in high school, you say F is equal to GMM over R squared and so on, right? But what makes a lot more sense is to talk about the acceleration because the acceleration of all particles is the same. So you could imagine an acceleration field outside of mass. Here's the Earth. Outside the Earth, at any point, we can compute what the acceleration would be of any object, whatever size, whatever shape and mass, etc., density. We know exactly what the acceleration would be. Acceleration would be such and such amount 
in that direction. Over here it would be the same amount, but in that direction. Over here it would be a little bit less, and so on and so forth. So instead of talking about a force, and then having to figure out how that force affects different particles, what we do is we talk about an acceleration, a field in space, and the acceleration that any particle will experience in that field. That's a, a very clean, very nice way of thinking about gravity. You have an acceleration field. It doesn't depend on the particles themselves. It's just caused by the matter. If you place an object, a particle, in that field, it will accelerate according to the value of that field. Now that obviously is a vector field, because at each point it has a magnitude and it has a direction. So you have a vector field in space. And it tells you also that this is a property of the medium. Gravity, the ordinary gravity that we spoke of earlier, and you, you learned kind of in high school, is a vector field that is a property of the space. It's not a property of the particles falling in. It's given rise to by some matter. You have this field in space, and it's a vector field. Now, we've rejected that. We throw away that model. No, gravity is not a vector field in space. It still is a property of the medium. It still is a property of the space. But it's not this vector field. Because what it has to describe are these interesting relative accelerations. So instead of having a vector pointing in a certain direction, we have something that points kind of in a double-edged way, up in both directions like this, up down at the same time, and in. So at every point in space, in every region, what this tidal field tells us is what would happen, what would happen to neighboring inertial particles. If you put neighboring inertial particles here, they would have these relative accelerations. So that's a complex kind of mathematical entity to describe all that. It's not describing one acceleration in, in a certain direction. It's describing a bunch of different relative accelerations. It's not a unique directionality, so to speak. It's a, and, and that turns out to be a tensor. So the tidal tensor is what describes mathematically all this effect. So now we're we have a model of gravity that tells us that in the vicinity of matter, there is a tidal effect on the space, and it's described by a tensor. If we want to set up a field equation, we're going to have cause equal effect. So we're going to have something to do with the matter equals the result. And the result would be this tidal tensor. So we can already expect that on the left-hand side, we're going to have some tensor that represents the matter. Now, a tensor is not going to represent matter. Of course, we're already expecting, if we know special relativity of matter and energy, and it turns out that energy gives rise to this effect as well. And you can't always distinguish between what is matter energy and there are other aspects as well. We'll see pressure and so on. So you have a tensor created out of all the properties of this stuff, the matter and density and the energy density and the pressure and so on and so forth. And that tensor will equal to something like a tidal tensor. That means in any given frame, however you express this tensor, you'll have this component will equal this component, this component will equal this component, this component is equal to that component on the two sides of the equation. So now we have this beautiful model, which is a very radical understanding of gravity. And we would want to find some kind of mathematical basis for it. But before we do that, we're going to go on to answer a question, what does all this have to do with relativity? Okay, so let's see, does anybody know, they did not know from before, but can anybody figure out based on what we spoke about? You mean like special relativity? Without special relativity, we're ignoring special relativity at the moment. Now, special relativity is very, 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 very basic. If you think very deeply into space and time, you come up with special relativity. If you think very deeply into electromagnetism, you come up with special relativity. Any measurement that you make, even the measurements that we're talking about, measuring tidal accelerations, need equipment and machines and, and objects, and objects are made of atoms, and atoms has electromagnetism and other forces, obviously. And in order to make all that work, you need special relativity. So the truth is, at some point, you get to special relativity no matter what. But if we're kind of operating in that post-Galilean post-Newtonian, post-Galilean, pre-Einstein time. Because everything that we said now 
would be pretty much comprehensible to a Newtonian physicist. We didn't introduce anything that's not really Newtonian gravity. We just made some radical suggestions. And we came up with this notion of, of gravity as a property of the space, which gives rise to relative accelerations. Um, so um, before, before I leave this topic and move to the, to the relativity, I just want to define a term locally inertial or frames which are locally inertial, so it will be local inertial frames. And you'll see in some places LIF, LIFs, okay, capital L, capital I, capital F. What does that mean? It means exactly what we were talking about. When we're in free fall and we have clearly relative acceleration, right? So if we're, imagine we're in this room, right? And we don't know whether we are accelerated as a, as a rocket in empty space or whether we are in a gravitational field, right? Now we could determine the answer. We simply let a bunch of objects free in the room, okay? And uh, obviously we're going to, they're gonna to fall to the ground and we feel this, but we can see whether there is a slight difference between the direction of the fall, okay? If there's a slight difference between the direction of the fall, we detect these uh, tidal forces. And then we know it's not a result of acceleration because if, if, there's, if we're in a rocket that's accelerating up, then everything falls exactly in the same way in the same straight line. Okay? So clearly, each particle we say is inertial, but on the other hand, if we're measuring any object, even a particle has structure, but any object that has structure, that means that two edges of it, right, this edge of the object and this edge of the object are experiencing slightly different accelerations. And this part of the object and this part of the object have slightly different accelerations, so there'll be stresses inside it. So it's going to give away the fact that it's in a gravity situation rather than accelerated. So we define a local inertial frame, meaning if you get to a small enough region where you can claim that this is homogeneous, uniform, like, like as we talk about in high school, 9.8 meters per second square, then it's inertial. Okay, but we, we can see that it's a conceptually deep thing that it's indistinguishable from inertial, but obviously the larger your frame, the more you're going to be able to determine that in fact there is this relative acceleration and it is gravity rather than an accelerated plate. So to distinguish this, we call them local inertial frames or locally inertial frames. So this is basically Einstein's theory that locally inertial frames exist and that's what gravity is about. So now, what does this have to do with relativity? Well, if you think about the indistinguishability that we spoke about that Galileo and others discovered, you have inertial frames that are indistinguishable from each other. So you cannot claim that one is stationary and one is moving at 50 miles an hour and one is moving at 500 miles an hour. All you can see is the relative motion. That's the only thing that could be measured. The one who claims he's stationary measures a relative speed relative to the others, and so do they. They can say that they are stationary. If there's no observable phenomenon in an inertial frame, then the one that you say is moving at 500 miles an hour can equally claim to be stationary, and it's you who's moving at 500 miles an hour. So there is no unequivocal uh, determination that one is stationary, one is moving, or how fast you're moving. They're all the same. They're all inertial states. And the only thing that can be measured is the relative motion of these inertial states. Now we go one step further. The idea proposed by Newton and, and expounded on by Maxwell that if you have an equally accelerating force, so it accelerates everything equally, then things will be accelerated, at least as viewed from outside the system, or that's what we're saying, it's an equally accelerated force. So we're, we're supposing that there is acceleration, and yet you cannot measure this acceleration. The only thing that you'd be able to measure would be relative acceleration. So you can call that some kind of Newton-Maxwell relativity. Einstein applied this to gravity, and even though Maxwell actually mentioned gravity as an example, it may be that he didn't pursue it further because it's clear that there are these tidal accelerations, and therefore it does seem to be non-inertial. But what Einstein did is he said, no, these frames are indistinguishable from inertial frames, and I'm going to say that they are inertial, and the fact that there's this relative acceleration is going to be what gravity is all about. It's not a disproof of the model. It tells you what the model is, 
there are locally inertial frames, or local inertial frames. That's what gravity is. And when you're in free fall, you cannot tell that you're accelerated. The only thing you can find is this relative acceleration. And it's that relative acceleration that is the phenomenon. And that's Einstein's more generalized form of relativity, as opposed to the relativity of Galileo, or as opposed to the relativity of equally accelerated forces, meaning it's a uniform field and you can't distinguish any kind of acceleration. He was talking about real cases of gravity where you have equally accelerated forces, but they're different at each place. And therefore, you will observe a relative acceleration. And he was saying, nevertheless, these are individually indistinguishable, and that's a more generalized form of relativity. And there are other ways to arrive at a term general relativity. You can start with special relativity and generalize it. All right, so there, that's not the only meaning to the term general relativity, just like what I said before was not the only meaning to the equivalence principle. Now, one can read in the literature a lot of equivocations about the equivalence principle. Uh, the equivalence principle sometimes is stated as gravity affects all particles or all objects the same way. Um, and, you know, that is true, but it's not true because obviously they're affected in different ways. You know? Or you can say that you can't distinguish gravity in free fall, but it's not true because you see the tidal effect. So I prefer saying the equivalence principle as what I said the law of gravity is. Inertial particles encountering the region in which there is matter, matter energy, will remain inertial, but there is relative acceleration between them. That's all. So, and obviously, the smaller your frame and the less precise your measurements, the less you're going to be able to detect those, and the more you're going to tend to say that they are inertial. And, and obviously, if you get more and more precise measurements, you're going to find tidal effects, and you will know that you are in a gravitational field. But that doesn't destroy the inertiality of the individual particles. That's the point. The individual particles are inertial. Now, you'll never be able to measure one individual particle. You, you've got to measure to see if there's an inertial force. You have to measure a few particles. And if you're sufficiently accurate, you will. But what we say is the individual particle is inertial each individual part, and the relative acceleration does not destroy that. Uh, any questions? Okay, now the next, uh, the next lecture, I'm um, not sure when it will be, will take everything that we discussed and model it mathematically, and we'll see why we're led to the notion of the existence of a space-time, why it has a geometry, what the geometry has to do with all this, and specifically what space-time curvature has to do with all this. Thank you for your attention.